Preterist apologetics. I had to stop there and think. Mike and I <laughs> both just worn smooth out. <laughs> yeah. We've just been hard, hard at it. Uh, Mike works at two jobs. He works at his regular job and then he works at preparing lessons. I, I work full time at what I'm doing in Preterist Research Institute. And, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, Mike, they say, well, how does it feel to be re retired, Don? I go, <laughs> <laughs> And I tell people, but they don't understand it. I said, look, I'm working harder probably than I ever have in my life at my ministry. Uh, I said, I'm doing the YouTube videos. I, I do anywhere from two to four blogs, you know, interviews a week. I'm writing my books and, you know. Having a blast. I, I'm having a ball. I, I'm absolutely having a ball. I love what I'm doing. And I tell people that I, I was at the chiropractor uh, just the other day and the gal at the front desk, she said, uh, she said, Dawn, I want to know something. I said, okay. She said, why are you always so happy? I said, well, I said several reasons. Number one, I'm a child of God. That's, that explains a whole lot in my books. And I said, secondly, I've got the greatest wife a guy could ever ask for. Mm. And thirdly, my job is what I want to do more than anything else. I said, so why wouldn't I be happy? <laughs> right. Amen. And, and she goes, wow, I've never heard things explained like that. And so, you know, and I get asked that quite a bit, you know, why are you always so happy? And I try to give the same answer almost every time, you know, but uh, they, they said, oh, cliche. If you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. I don't ever work. I am at the, I am at the office seven days a week without fail, unless I'm out of town. Even if I'm out of time, town, I'm on my computer at three 30, four o'clock in the morning. I'm working, I'm reading, I'm researching, I'm writing, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not a chore to me. Is it hard at times? Sure is, but boy, I'm having fun. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I wish I could get to that place where I, I could do it full time. But the Lord just says never open that door. So I just take one day at a time and whatever doors he opens. I understand I'll, that. I'll, I'll step through. But, um, you know, Mike, that's that's exactly and precisely what Jan and I decided. Uh, because I was this is long before COVID. I was getting so many opportunities to speak mm -hmm. that it, it was in, impinging on my time for the local ministry. And the congregation and I had talked about it many, many times and said, okay, the time is going to come in which I think it's going to be best to step away and get involved in the full-time ministry of seminars and writing and what have you. And that, that was day one from the time we started that congregation. So it wasn't anything, you know, there was no animosity. There was no bad feelings. There was absolutely no negative at all, but, yeah. You know, Jan and I would talk about it. It's like, well, how, how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to make a living? How are we going to pay our bills? Yeah. And I said, I, I just really don't know. I announced it for the very first time that we were planning on it. Uh, yeah. At Sparta, North Carolina. And I said, look, here's what we think about doing. At the moment, we don't have a dime of support raised. Hmm. So if this happens, you guys are going to have to help. I, I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. And we've been doing it every, all the time since then. Hmm. And it's just been, uh, at, and I got to tell you, there are times, and especially as a result of COVID, we lost so much monthly support. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable how much monthly support that we lost. And we still haven't recovered all of that. So it, it gets a little bit lean at times. And so I have to get on and ask people to support our ministry. 
but that's just part of doing what I do. And that's, if you get to that situation, you're just going to have to step out just like Jan and I did. Mm. You know, you're just going to have to say, I believe I can be more effective as a servant of God, servant of God to do this, you know, so reach out and reach out and touch some people, reach out and talk to them. And see yeah, what kind of it, it's, it's, getting, it's getting to the point where, you know, it, it's hard to balance work yeah. and this, it, it, it really is. And, and I'm kind of an, an all or nothing kind of guy as it is. That's my personality. <laughs> Yeah. It's like Pastor Curtis asked me to teach for him what last Sunday. And so I did a thing on Revelation 12 through 22. And but for me, it's like I can only focus on one thing. And then we've got the conference this month. So I've kind of that's what I'll be doing this weekend, you know, all weekend and next weekend. But um, so that's just kind of how my brain thinks. And so it's hard for me to be working while my mind is all in this. I mean, yes. constantly. Yes. But anyway, <laughs> a, a, enough of us. So, <laughs> folks, what we're doing, we're continuing to study the Song of Moses. And Don and I are really on this um, kick on the Kairos, the appointed time of Deuteronomy 32, 35 in the Septuagint, which Moses tells Israel, backing up to verse 5 and 20, when a certain perverse and twisted generation arrives the Israel's end would be near. And then when we get to 35, verse 35, he says, the appointed time of Israel's end would be near when that, again, going back to those other verses, when that generation, that last day's generation arrives. And so now we're looking at Jesus's eschatology, how he's developing the Song of Moses, but we're specifically honing in on the Kairos. And we're going to look at some texts tonight that are very eschatological. Last week, we looked at, you know, Mark 115, when Jesus says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is near or at hand. And so tonight, we're going to look at some eschatological passages. But Don, did you want to do any review as far as Jesus' statement that the appointed time is at hand? Well, I just simply wanted to correlate it. Uh, and before we came on on the air and before I logged in here, uh, I was looking again at Matthew chapter 17, 17, mm. because Jesus castigates his audience for right. their unbelief. And he says a wicked and a perverse generation refers to them as a wicked and perverse generation. And as we discussed last week, now here, the, the word Kairos is not in that specific text, as I remember it. But here's the point. By citing Deuteronomy, okay, 32, five and 20, five, five and 20 as the crooked and perverse generation. And here's the reason why this is so important, folks. Deuteronomy 32 talks about Israel's last days, Israel's last end. And it is that determined, appointed last end in which we find these references to the perverse and crooked generation. Okay, so here is Jesus after saying in Matthew chapter, Mark 115, excuse me, that the time, the appointed time is fulfilled. Well, real quick digression. Folks, the appointed time goes right back to Daniel. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Daniel 12. No, no other prophetic book speaks so eloquently and more, I don't want to use the word precisely because it may carry such specificity, specificity to it, but it, it is specific in denoting or in communicating what, what days or what kingdom, the days of the kingdom in which the kingdom would come. So that was the appointed time. The, the days of the fourth empire, that's Rome. Twice we have that designation. So we know that the days of the Roman Empire are the days of the appointed time. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Daniel chapter two also points out that that days of the, of the appointed time is the days of the last days. Well, what's Deuteronomy 32 about? Israel's last days. So as you pointed out so well uh, on different occasions, 
what you have in Deuteronomy is kind of a broad outline of things. But the, the farther along we go in the revelatory process of the word of God down through the centuries, we start seeing a refining, a refining and a defining of that appointed time. And Daniel, as I stated, more than any other book starts refining that time period down. Guys, that's in the Roman Empire. Amen. And then <laughs> guess what? Luke even refines it more. Now, in the days of Tiberius Caesar, or excuse me, Augustus Caesar, he sent out a decree saying that all the world should be taxed. And lo and behold, what happens? Here is Jesus who is born. Well, that refines it even more because Messiah was going to be born in those last days, you know. So now we've come down to the very days of Jesus and his birth as even more clearly and specifically defined as that appointed time. So when he comes along and begins his public ministry, uh, being about 30 years of age, according to Luke chapter three, what do we have? Jesus says, guys, it's, this is the time. This is the appointed time. So we come here to Luke, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 17. And by quoting, crooked and perverse generation, he goes ahead to call them. And let's see, what is the uh, specific terminology? Let me, uh, let me look this up just a little, for some reason or other. I, oh, come on now. I almost put Matthew 17, 17 up there. Yeah. Uh, and, um, just because, you know, folks, all you have to do is look at your cross reference to Matthew 17, 17, and it'll take you right to Deuteronomy 32, 5 and 20. Oh, Absolutely. Okay, now notice he's, he, when he calls them a faithless and perverse generation, all right? Now, remember, faithless and perverse generation is in the appointed time. But faithless also reminds us of another reference in Deuteronomy 32, and that's verse 28, that they are a people of no understanding. Right. And so you have a double, a double reference. One of them is explicit. The other is implicit. By being a faithless generation, they are the generation without any understanding. So as I suggested here, we have Jesus giving a double reference to the Song of Moses and applying it directly to the generation in which he was living. And boy, that's, that's just extremely powerful. And I've, I've got to tell you, in my upbringing, as I've already mentioned, I never heard any of this stuff. Never heard any references to the Song of Moses and how it applied to Jesus's ministry, how Jesus in his ministry goes back to Deuteronomy and, and the prophecy of Israel's last days and says, this is it. Not, not a sermon, not a reference. And I, as I go through, you know, I'll be really honest. I've gotten rid of most of my Church of Christ commentaries. Uh, and I, I don't want to seem overly harsh. Uh, they were written by good men, sincere men, but so many of them had had such a lack of scholarship that when I would read it, I was literally embarrassed hmm. at, at the lack of scholarship. So I, I literally gave a great number of my Church Christ commentaries away. And I know that if some of my Church Christ brethren are you know, watching this, listening, oh, you know, oh, well, it won't be the first time I've had my brethren upset, it, upset with me. So, <laughs> uh, and, and again, I'm not trying to be overly harsh or critical. It's just the fact of it. Right. Most of those commentators never gave, never gave a word to correlating between Old Testament prophecy of Jesus's ministry, except, oh, well, Matthew chapter one. You know, Jesus, born of a virgin. Okay, that's Isaiah 7. That's great. That's wonderful. That's valid. But that's not the end of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was such a disappointment to me as I began to expand my own research and to expand my own understanding of the correlation between the Old Testament and the New. It was so embarrassing to me to read these commentaries that just made no mention whatsoever of these relationships. I, I found those commentaries to be nothing but shelf space fillers. Right. And I wanted 
I wanted books on my shelf that were going to contribute to my understanding of the correlation between the Old Testament and the New. Jesus's dependence on the old. I mean, after all, he said, don't think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Well, he didn't come to, to fulfill just the virgin birth. <laughs> you know, the entirety of, of his ministry. I mean, all of it was the fulfillment of, the, of Old Testament prophecies. And so when I begin to see all of these New Testament references to all of these Old Testament prophecies and to realize the interrelationship and, and the interconnectedness, I, I mean, I was literally blown away and I was so thrilled. Absolutely. And I'm still thrilled almost every single day, you know, to find new connections and, and what have you. So, uh, but that's just, that's the beauty of seeing those correlations between the old and the new. And that's what I'm saying on Matthew chapter 17, 17. It's not a singular reference that Jesus is making. Jesus is doubly for, reinforcing the fact that he's drawing from the song of Moses, which means he was living in the last days. Israel's last days are upon them. Yeah, amen. I've had to throw away uh, a lot of my Calvary Chapel premillennial dispensational commentaries that I thought were all that in a bag of chips. Yeah. And then uh, I've hung on to most of my reform stuff, uh, especially my partial preterist stuff and oh, yeah. some, you know, GK Beale, all oh, yeah. millennial, because there's some scholarship there, N.T. Wright. Um, but you're right. When it comes to topics like this, it's hard to find. You have to find a nugget from this guy over here, a nugget from this person over here, and they just haven't quite put it all together. Um, the way Don and I are trying to do for you folks. Uh, so we have Mark 115. The appointed time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Now we looked at this being a parallel to John the Baptist saying the same thing, right? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand in Matthew 3, 2. But then how at hand and what does that look like? The kingdom got, uh, kingdom of God coming, John. Well, it's going to be a time of judgment when there's a wrath that's about to come. So you Pharisees better repent. The axe is laid at the root of the tree. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And his time of gathering his people into the barn or into the kingdom was near. And his time of judging the wicked was near. So the kingdom of God being at hand is not just the already of eschatology, Christ's death, his ascension and resurrection. John the Baptist is clearly intending when he says the kingdom of God is at hand, he's looking at that not yet, but that not yet is not 2000 plus years away. <laughs> it's 40 years away. Amen. And that connects with what Don is saying when Jesus is going back to Deuteronomy 32 and he's saying, Hey, this generation, our generation is the terminal generation that will see the end of our old covenant age coming to a near end. And so if you if you don't understand the, the Old Testament background to where Jesus is quoting, you're gonna miss so much. And, and you know- Particularly it, about John the baptizer, as you know, I mean, I wrote a book on Elijah has come. I, I am absolutely convinced, Mike, and I've, I've, wrote, I've written this in this book, other, obviously, than Jesus and Paul, John the baptizer is the most significant eschatological figure in the entirety of the New Testament. I am absolutely, totally convinced of that. Now, let's pick up on something you said here and brought our attention to in Matthew chapter 3. Here is John, and let's not forget, folks, John was Elijah. Now, I know our dispensational friends deny that, but it's undeniable. I mean, <laughs> real quick, Don. Yeah. The, con the context to, to uh, Matthew 17, 17, if you look right right above that, it's a he's talking about John the Baptist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyway, if, if, if you will accept it, he is John. The, he is Elijah. That is to come. OK. Pardon me. So here's something that's in, when I begin to see this, Mike, it, it was just amazing. Now, let me re reflect back a little bit on my upbringing in my early days. 
as I was beginning to understand coveted eschatology and I was struggling with my own concepts, I attended a, uh, a Church of Christ lectureship in Memphis, Tennessee at the Get Well Church of Christ in, in I think it was late 1976. It was after my father had died and Jan and I went and with our newborn daughter, Donnell, and so we go to this lectureship with my mother and my, and my wife and baby. And one of the preachers that I grew up admiring tremendously was a minister by the name of Roy Deaver. He was considered in the Church of Christ to be quite a scholar. I was particularly focused on his lesson. You know, in, in the lead up and the advertisement, they talked about how Roy Deaver was going to give a lesson on John the baptizer and his role. Well, I had already, look, this is 1976. I was already del delving deep into the significance of John. I was already beginning to see how important he was. I had already seen that he was Elijah. I had already begun to see the connections with the book of Malachi. So boy, you know, I was really, really, really on the edge of my seat. He gets up and he spends 45 minutes and did not mention John as Elijah over except in a passing reference. Oh, wow. And when he mentioned John's message, repent for the kingdom of heaven, you know, has drawn near and who has warned you to flee from the wrath that is about to come. And his winnowing fork is in his hand. The ax is already at the root. He glossed right over it. And I'm sitting there going, okay, here you have a guy who is considered a scholar. He is spending almost an hour talking about John. He gives two minutes of citations of John's message of impending judgment, does not go back to Malachi to identify him as Elijah. Or, or Isaiah 40. Or Isaiah 40. Now, he did mention that he's the voice. Okay. Oh, yeah. He did not mention the judgment context of right. Isaiah 40. Okay. So I'm sitting there literally stunned and how superficial this lesson was. Now, if you wanted a lesson to give you sermon material, homiletic material, right. oh, okay, that's fine. But was it exegetical material? Was it delving into the, the interrelationship between Malachi and John? No, except, like I said, these little snippets. And so when we come to look at John and how Jesus said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A prophet? Well, I tell you, there's never been a greater prophet than John the Baptist, J John the Baptizer, period. No one greater than John. And he's Elijah, by the way. So that ought to tell us something. And when we look at that, of the eminence of those passages that you've already cited, Matthew 3, verse 2, Matthew 3, 7, Matthew 3, 10 to 12, and you see that John's message, there is not one thing. And this is what's so disturbing. And, you know, in many of these commentaries that I have, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And what do they do? End of time. End of time. Yeah. And you're going, oh, wait a minute. How does that rate to, relate to the acts that's already at the root? Are you telling us, you know, <laughs> this is John was saying, oh, well, the end of time is already right here, or you're telling us that John was talking about the wrath that is about to come. And it's stunning, as you well know, to read so many of the critical commentators and they say, and, and uh, Don, uh, say, what's his name in the in a word biblical commentary? Oh my goodness. A anyway, in the word biblical commentary, uh, co the name will come to me momentarily. He says the eminence of John John's message in Matthew chapter three is brought out by the Greek word mellow. Yes. Thank you very much. Don Hagner. I knew it'd come. <laughs> so, and he goes through there and he talks about the eminence and he talks about the imagery of the ax at the root and that that's eminent language. Okay. And the winnowing fork is already in his hand. That's a language of eminence. Thank you very much. But Hagner, like so many of these critical commentary commentators, well, Jesus may have been talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, but he's probably talking about the end of time. Yeah. So, John, John, you mean, 
John was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. He had such a myopic view of eschatology. Not to mention that that's the harvest is what John is predicting, which is the resurrection, which kind of ties into our next passage where Kairos is used. Um, Matthew 13, 33, let, talking about the parable of the wheat and the tares, let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, but then gather the wheat into my barn. So it's interesting when you do a study on Kairos, at least in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, it's always connected to the feasts. Mm -hmm. and particularly the harvest. Um, so it is interesting because Jesus will later quote in verse 43 of this um, chapter, the resurrection of Daniel 12, 3, where the righteous will shine like the stars of the heaven. And that's the resurrection at the end of their old covenant age. So harvest is an appointed time. The harvests are types and shadows of the eschaton, right? And so you can kind of see how they're all tied together. Because when we were talking about Daniel 70 weeks, we brought out how the harvest theme is present in just about all those, you know, the, the day of atonement mm -hmm. with the, uh, you know, taking away of sin and atoning for sin and so forth. So, yeah, and, and especially when you tie in that appointed time, as you were just hinting at right there with the harvest and Daniel chapter 12, which as your, as your chart here shows this, this harvest of Matthew 13, verse 43, uh, 39 through 43 was going to be at the appointed time of the resurrection, which is a citation. Then shall the righteous shine forth, you know, as the stars in the kingdom. That's an echo, direct echo, direct citation of Daniel chapter 12 and verse three. But wait a minute, that harvest, that time of the end, and it is the, the Suntulia Cairo, the appointed time of the end. Okay, that's what Daniel is talking about. The appointed time of the end. That is the time of the resurrection of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of earth shall arise some to everlasting life, some to everlasting condemnation. I would tell a story about that passage that somebody got me into last week until they got until they just got completely embarrassed but i, I won't go into that but <laughs> it was so funny so anyway uh here is the resurrection which is the harvest the time of the harvest is at the end of the age the suntalia kairu the appointed time of the end okay and that is daniel chapter 12 verse 3 but that would take place when the power of the holy people is completely shattered well jesus says the harvest as it is at the end of the age. Now that's that's an expanded form of Suntalia Cairo, mm -hmm. but it's Suntalia to Aeonion. It is the consummation of the age. Well, the, the consummation of the age is the appointed time of the end of Daniel chapter 12. Exactly. You know, that you, these they're they're slightly different terms, but they all point to the same eschaton. There, mm -hmm. there's not a there's not a hope of Israel and then separate and distinct and apart from that, a hope of the church at the end of the church age. Those are foreign concepts to the biblical narrative. So you, you have this harvest at the appointed time of the end, which is the end of the age. That's the end of the age that the apostles were asking about. Mm -hmm. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and the apostles immediately responded by asking, tell us when shall these things be? What should be the sign of your parousia and the end of the age? The suntalia to Aeonion. Same identical term. And even though Luke 21 does not record the question of the end of the age, Probably because Matthew is dealing more with the Jewish audience. So yeah, he probably. he he uses the end of the age, their age, more parables, more recapitulation because of his Jewish audience. But although Luke does not record the end of the age, he does record here in Luke 21, 8, 
the appointed time is near. So he is going back to Daniel and he is going back to Deuteronomy 32. So like you said, uh, Daniel connects the end or the end of the age with the appointed time. So the, although Luke doesn't have the end of the age, he definitely is focusing in on the appointed time of Daniel. Oh, absolutely. And let's tie another passage in with this to segue between Matthew 13, 33 and Luke chapter 21. And that's in Luke chapter 19. Uh, I've, I've got my other screen open here to Luke chapter 19, 41 and following. As Jesus drew near the city, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day. Now, that's that's a critical term within itself. The things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and, and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, I don't know of a commentator that denies that he was talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Is that Kairos? No. Oh. Okay. No, Kairos does not appear there. Uh, the Hamera, the day, you you have not known the day of your visitation. There's so, there are so many distinctive words there in Luke chapter 19. Yeah. The word visitation is one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a fantastic word. And in my book, uh, these are the days in which all things must be fulfilled. I have a special chapter on, on the use, biblical usage of the day of visitation. I mean, it's a highly, highly significant term over and over and over in the, in the Old Testament. You have references to the day of the Lord. Well, that day of the Lord was invariably the day of visitation. In which the Lord said, I will visit my people. Well, that, vis that visit the people could be in either cursing, back to Deuteronomy 32, or blessings. Mm -hmm. You know, the law of blessings and cursings of chapter 28 to 30 in Deuteronomy. So that word visit is extremely uh, critical. Now, here's the point that I wanted to make. We already know from Daniel chapter 9 that the time, the appointed time, the Cairo, and the end of the appointed time, the soon Talia Cairo, Daniel chapter 9, would bring about the end, the soon Talia of the desolations. Mm -hmm. which is the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got Daniel using Cairo or Kairos. And it's in the last uh, second half of the 70th week. Here is Jesus in Luke chapter 19, although he, do, he doesn't say, well, as Daniel said, and he doesn't use Suntulia Cairo, but what's he talking about? The destruction of Jerusalem, which Daniel foretold for the consummation of the appointed time. Exactly. This is a classic example, and I'm I'm reading a book right now. Uh, when the stars shall fall from heaven, uh, last name of the author is Adams, and he says that the Bible definitely predicts the end of time. Okay, and it's absolutely amazing to me as I read this, quote, scholarly world, unquote, and he's interacting with N.T. Wright, Scott McKnight, and some other scholars who deny that Jesus was predicting the end of time. And yet here's what's remarkable, remarkable about it. I don't want to get too far afield on this. On the one hand, he said, the reader needs to understand that I am not affirming the end of the time-space continuum. Okay. And then he goes ahead to say that would have been contrary to all Jewish teaching of the time. Okay, that's N.T. Wright's position. And then he turns right around and says, what I am affirming is that this language of the destruction of heaven and earth is, li is to be taken literally. Mm. Okay. <laughs> right. uh, mouth talking here, mouth talking here. <laughs> uh, as I, re I read over it two or three times today, I go, wait a minute, do you believe in the end of, end of time or do you not believe in the end of time? Uh, and the reason I'm reading that is, of course, of course, October the 12th, I've got that debate with Richard Carrier coming up. Mm. And, you know, he affirms that Jesus predicted the end of time. Mm. Well, OK. 
So you, here you've got a book that affirms on one hand that Jesus did predict in the end of time. And then he turns right around and says, I'm not affirming the end of time because that would have run counter to the standard Jewish belief of the day. <laughs> so not, not the end of time, just, just a, a new planet where time continues, apparently. Well, that would be, now I, and I haven't read far enough to determine if, if he believes that the Jews believed something uh and of course nt Wright takes this position uh whether he takes the position that well what they believed was that the planet earth would be recreated i mean that's the only thing left to him right. literally that's the only he he can't literally say well they did not believe in the end of time but they did believe in the end of time he's got to have a moderating position that says well they believed that this physical creation would be radically purged in fire supposedly like the Greeks, uh, but they didn't believe in the end of time, but they believed in the renovation of planet Earth. And again, that's what N.T. Wright and uh, so many of the partial preterists, uh, G.K. Beale believes that as well. Right. So this, this whole concept, wh when you view all of these modern commentators, as they talk about the, the appointed time and as they talk about uh, the passing of heaven and earth and they talk about the new creation and everything, what are they doing? They're completely overlooking the fact that Jesus said the time is fulfilled. The appointed time has come. Yeah. Don, don't you think it's interesting since Kairos is used in the in Daniel 70 weeks there in uh, chapter 9, verses 26 and 27 a couple times. Isn't it interesting that Gentry poo-poos the dispensationalists and the amillennialist that wants to double fulfill these things or stretch them out as not historical events, but a tribulation that's spanning between Jesus first coming, second coming. And he would, he would say no way to the dispensationalist that would say, okay, well maybe there was a judgment on a temple in AD 70, but that's a type of another appointed time. The real one, the real one, when the Jews rebuild the temple, now that's the real appointed time and the real end. It wasn't, you know, the appointed time in eighty seventy. Now he would say you can't do that. But when it comes to the resurrection being a historical appointed time connected to a historical event of the tribulation that he only gives one fulfillment to. How do you separate that <laughs> and untangle that? You can't. But Amen. he says these things. So he can continue to be orthodox and creedal. Uh, and you're exactly right. Uh, when, when you when you lay Kenneth Gentry's concepts and ideas, his teaching, up beside dispensationalism and their rationalization, oh well, as you were saying, oh yeah, there was a judgment in eighty seventy, but it's certainly not the real one. Well, Gentry would go, Amen. That's what I teach. And now here's the deal: you're not going to find, at least I haven't found. Uh, you're not going to find the dispensationalists agreeing that great tribulation was in the first century. And Gen Gentry is adamant that the great tribulation was in the first century. This is where Gentry entraps himself. Amen. There is only one great tribulation mentioned in the Bible. I mean, that's, that's it. Yep. And in one of my lessons coming up in Jonesboro, Arkansas, I'm going to be documenting that. There was one eschatological great tribulation but here's what, where Gentry misses it. Number one, he acknowledges, teaches, and affirms the Great Tribulation was in the first century in connection with the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. It was in, during that period of the Jewish war. Okay. There's not going to be a future great, gener great Tribulation that we're waiting for, like the dispensationalists say. <coughs> They're completely wrong. They're misguided. They're misusing the scripture. The dispensationalists, there is a growing number of them who are willing to admit. See, this is funny. Even John Walvard, and I think it's Kenneth Zuck, if I'm not uh, not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, you, you're familiar yeah. with that. Yeah. They, they admit that the destruction of Babylon at the hands of the Assyrians, and then eventually at the hands of the Medes of the Persians, they admit that was a day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and the decreation language of those nations was figurative. That's exactly right. Isaiah 13. Yes. So at least Wolverton and Zuck could theoretically admit, okay, 
Yeah, there was there was kind of a tribulation in AD 70, and that was a day of the Lord, a historical day of the Lord in AD 70. But that pointed forward to the end of time, to the real tribulation and the real day of the Lord. And uh -huh. Jesus would go, wait, 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 wait. No, uh, you're half right. The tribulation was in AD 70. There was a day of the Lord, and it's typological. So. <laughs> yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too there. Uh, on that exactly right so the point of fact is ladies and gentlemen throughout the old testament there's one great tribulation connected with the resurrection at Not the appointed time at the appointed time the appointed hour <clears throat> daniel chapter 12 in the old greek so when you have throughout the tanakh the old testament as well as in the new tri new testament this connectedness between the tribulation and the resurrection and the parousia, where do our partial preterist friends justify? Oh yeah, you know, James Jordan. Uh, it, it is inexcusable. <laughs> I'll use a kind word. James Jordan says it's absolutely inexcusable for the modern day commentaries to rip the great tribulation out from the first century. Just absolutely no excuse for it whatsoever. Well, I agree with that. And Gentry agrees with that. DeMar agrees with that. Matheson agrees with that. Okay, but, but then what do uh, they Wilson do? Wilson agrees with that. Uh, Wilson <laughs> agrees with that. But then they take that Jehorkin's penknife and they cut right between the tribulation and the resurrection unless you take Kenneth Gentry's position that says, well, after all, uh, I would affirm, Brother Gentry might say, yes, there was a spiritual resurrection in AD 70 as the corporate body of Israel was transformed into the spiritual body of Christ. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and he initially wrote to me saying that had nothing to do with physical corpses coming out of the ground. And then oh, he, yeah. he evolved over time, seeing the train coming, saying, well, I'm going to have to give it a spiritual corporate resurrection interpretation for AD 70. But that's going to be a type of a physical because he can't disconnect Daniel 12 from John 5 and 6, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20, 12 and 13. And on and on it goes. So he knew he had to do something to stay orthodox and creedal. And that's that was his evolution on that. And he still just, but again, like Don and I are saying, it's the passage says one end and it's connected to one appointed time. There's not two appointed times and there's not two ends. And that's really important for you guys to see because these partial preterists are performing eisegesis. They're reading two things in the text that clearly say is one. And so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves and, and get into the book of Revelation, but when, when John says in Revelation 1, 3, the appointed time is near, he is going back to Daniel. So it's not just the time text that you preterists need to get excited about. It's what exactly was near. <laughs> ah, the resurrection of Daniel 12 was near. Yeah, that, that singular kairos, uh, as you said so very well there, the appointed time of the end covers all of these constituent elements of eschatology. It's the appointed time of the new creation. It's the appointed time of the kingdom. It's the appointed time of the parousia. It's the appointed time of the judgment. <clears throat> you don't have different appointed times for each one of these constituent elements. A different appointed time. It is one appointed time for all of these things to come into a reality. Yeah. And and this is this is our problem with the partial preterists who <clears throat> are trying to dichotomize between those constituent elements and what have you. And you you wind up with a what I call a mishmash uh, of eschatology. And you wind up with two or three different eschatological hopes, kind of like, as I pointed out before, Joel McDermott, in my formal debate with him here at Ardmore in 2012, he tried to affirm that there was a hope of Israel and an eschatological hope 
of Israel, but then there's an eschatological hope for the Gentiles or, or the church at the end of time. That's not, that wasn't Paul's doctrine. There is one hope. And Paul's hope was found in Moses, the law, and the prophets. And as I pointed out in that debate, <clears throat> you have one eschatological hope it iterated in Genesis chapter 3, in which God speaking to the woman and to the serpent, that this, although the word kairos is not there, and I understand that, I'm not trying to say otherwise, but at the appointed time, the seed of woman would crush the head of Satan. Satan would bruise the heel of the Messiah. Well, guess what? That's talking about Messiah's triumph over Satan at the end. <clears throat> and Paul in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, writing to the Romans said, the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. And boy, I tell you, Mike, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, <clears throat> but there's some folks out there right now that they're trying to say, well, the word crush there doesn't really mean crush. It just simply means uh, to sort of kind of bruise him. Uh, it, 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 it's not really the eschatological judgment uh, I, I was in a conversation, written conversation on Facebook uh, for a week and a half with a lady. Very, very, very nice woman. <clears throat> very well read, I must say. Uh, she's far, she's as well read as most preterists. I, I will say that. And, and she did her best art, articulate. But when she tried to say, well, Romans 16, 20 is not the final victory. It, it, it's an interim victory. It's probably the beginning of the millennium. It's not the end of the millennium for the crushing of Satan. And my head was just basically spinning. You know, I mean, you, uh, you, you won't find very many commentators out there that, that are going to agree with that. Back to Kenneth Gentry. He says Romans 16, 20 is an echo of, of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And almost all of the commentators that I have on the book of Romans, likewise, take you right back to Romans or to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It's just basically a given. I believe if I remember correctly, Greg, Greg, pardon me, Greg Bonson said that Paul in Romans 16, 20 was directly echoing Genesis 3, 15. Wow. Yeah, they have a serious problem there. Well, you know what, Don? I, I want to kind of address what Mark 1, 15 says in relation to Luke 21, 8. Because mm -hmm. on the surface, this appears to be a contradiction. Jesus, early in his ministry is saying the appointed time of the kingdom was near. But let's look, what, let's look at and see what he says in Luke 21, 8. Yep. And they asked him saying, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, watch out that you are not deceived for many will come in my name saying, I am he and the appointed time is near. Do not go after them. Now, let me give you my explanation of this and you tell me what what your view is. Like uh, Matthew 16, 27. For the son of man, and he uses the Greek word mellow. For the son of man is about to come in the glory of his father. He will reward each man according to what he has done. Verily I say unto you, there's some standing here who will not taste death till I see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Well, why is he saying? He say, he's saying right there that this is about to take place. The second coming is about to take place. You have to remember the context here of Mark 1 and the context of Matthew 16. The context is that the Jewish nation and humanity has been waiting thousands of years for the Messiah to come and his appointed time of salvation. All right. And so he could very well say in his earthly ministry, the kingdom is near. Pointing to AD 70, even though that's 40 years away. Because in, a, in their lifetime, compared to thousands of years, it's near. <laughs> but the context of the Olivet Discourse is interjecting this issue of signs in relation to how near it's going to be. Now, Jesus, in that context, is saying, now, we're gonna, you're going to have some false prophets. You're going to have some false messiahs saying that the end is near before it really is. And then he gives a list of signs, general signs, covenantal cursing signs 
that were just going to be the signs of the times, birth pains. Mm -hmm. All right. But he says, and the end will not be during these signs. But he gives two specific signs that would mark the true near end of the appointed time. And the main one being the Great Commission. And, you know, Don, we've both talked about, and I got this from you, actually, your your book on the Great Commission, where, where Jesus and Paul are in lockstep. Sure. Every Greek word Jesus uses to describe the Great Commission, Paul uses, and he uses it in the past tense, that it had been fulfilled. Whether it's ethnos, gi, even cosmos, right. um, oikomene, they're all used by Paul to say the gospel had been preached. So if that sign had been fulfilled, then Paul could genuinely say the second coming is near. The kingdom is near. The resurrection is near or what have you. So we have to look at, this isn't a contradiction between Mark 1.15 and Luke 21 because the contexts are different because in Luke 21, we're dealing with signs. Is that Absolutely. how you understand this? <clears throat> Absolutely the way I view it. Uh, and I think you did a great job of explaining it there. And I've, I've, I've iterated that same kind of concept concept I, I think what we really have here to build on the foundation that you've laid there is we have a classic classic case of the already but the not yet mm -hmm. now so very very often in scripture and i've i've written on this in different places in the great majority of cases the prophets were concerned not with the initiation but with the consummation mm -hmm. some prophecies have to do with initiation Okay, Isaiah chapter 42, uh, behold my servant, he shall, a bruised reed shall he not break, a smoking flax shall he not quench. Okay, that's the initiation of Jesus's ministry. And it says he shall not fail nor be uh, discouraged until he has established just judgment in the earth. So here we are talking about the initiation of the kingdom, the initiation of the judgment process the initiation of, of Jesus's message. But you have this contrast between the initiation of Jesus's ministry, which is the suffering servant ministry, okay, versus his coming in judgment and wrath and glory. And, and you've pointed out before, and I think you do in, in your book, if I remember correctly, how the Jews just didn't get the concept of these two different comings. They envisioned two different messiahs, right? You know, and what have you? Well, no, it wasn't two different messiahs. It was the beginning of of his work versus the consummation. And the Greek word "telos" points us directly into that direction. And that's back to one of the signs that you just mentioned: the the com consummation of the Great Commission. This gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. Then comes the telos. Well, what were the apostles asking about? <laughs> exactly. And this is where Gentry boggle, fumbles it again. Yes. You would say, Matthew 24, 14, the Great Commission and the end was fulfilled. And then he'll say Jewish age for yep. end in Matthew 24, 14. And he will not connect it with the question about the end of the age. <laughs> so eisegetical. You know, I keep asking this question, uh, and this was like two weeks ago. Uh, another Facebook or YouTube exchange, this individual, well, the disciples were obviously asking about the end of the world. And I said, well, let's drop back here. What age did the temple represent? You know, Mike, I find that people have never given this any thought. Yeah. What was there about Jesus's prediction about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple that they were sitting there looking at what was it about that prediction that would make them think about the end of the Christian age, for crying out loud, yeah. or the end of the space-time continuum? And to go back to that book I referenced that I'm reading by Adams, he acknowledges the Jews of the time had no concept of the end of time. They, they had no view, certainly no cosmological view, to uh, that would even approach our modern concept of, of the cosmos and what have you. But they just didn't think in terms of the end of time. Okay, so why why in the world would the apostles, who were not raised believing in the end of the cosmos, 
think about the end of the cosmos <laughs> when Jesus predicted the destruction of that Jerusalem. And yet this is a very common belief. Even John Calvin commenting on Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 in the apostles' questions said those apostles simply could not conceive of the destruction of that temple if it were not to occur at the end of time. And in my notes out beside that, I, I wrote, why? <laughs> and the reason for that is, wait a minute. You're telling me that the apostles automatically had to think about the end of time when Jesus predicted the destruction of that temple. Wait a minute. Did the apostles not know that the temple, the Solomonic temple was destroyed in 586 BC and yet time didn't end? The physical cosmos didn't dissolve. I mean, let's face it, according to Zechariah, they actually had three separate, or was it four separate feast days to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. So why in the world would anybody say the apostles were absolutely thinking about the end of time or more... I, to me, uh, and I certainly don't want to come across as harsh here, it is absolutely ludicrous to believe that the apostles were thinking about the end of the Christian age <clears throat> when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, which in no way, shape, form, or fashion symbolized the Christian age. The Christian age, the, the, the new covenant age hadn't even begun. Hadn't so here they are thinking, oh, you're talking about the destruction of this temple. Okay, when's time going to end? When's the Christian age going to end? What? Right, right. Uh, and, I'm sorry, there's no logical connection here. And Don, did they did the disciples not also understand Isaiah earlier on in Isaiah and at the end of Isaiah that at, when the day of the Lord takes place, men are going to hide in caves from his presence but not only that, but that there, there would be this righteous remnant that would be survivors of this day of the Lord that's supposed to end world history. So they survive this allegedly planetary, planetary engulfment and fire. Somehow they, they escape this, they're survivors of it. And then they go on and preach the gospel to the nations. So I'm not really sure it's 100% certain in the Jewish mind that the planet was going to burn up when we have these Old Testament texts that say there's a righteous remnant that survived this day of the Lord. They lived through it and they continue preaching the gospel to sinners in the new creation. You know, I, I said this in several conversations on Facebook some couple of years ago. When all these issues were being raised, I said, you know, guys, it seems to me <clears throat> that when people insist that the apostles automatically were thinking about the destruction of time, destruction of, of the Christian age, the end of the cosmos, et cetera, et cetera, when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, what you are asking us to believe is that the apostles were the biggest bunch of dummies. Hmm. And it makes you wonder why Jesus didn't just get rid of every single one of them and go get himself a bunch of new, of new apostles and disciples. And here's the reason why. In order to say, and by the way, some of those individuals with whom I was in a conversation said, the apostles have no concept whatsoever that the temple was ever supposed to be destroyed. I, I got to admit, that blew me away. In, in order to make that claim, you've got to say that the apostles were ignorant of Daniel chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Totally, absolutely, 100% ignorant of Daniel 12. They had no concept whatsoever of Daniel chapter 9, 26, and 27. And they had no concept as, of Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, the two passages that you were alluding to right there. They had no concept of Isaiah 24, 25. 26 or 27. Right. I mean, and, and those are not all of them. <laughs> they had no concept of the book of Zephaniah, the book of Micah, or the book of Zechariah. So what I'm saying here is 
in the Old Testament, there was an extended testimony. And let me allude to that book again. These are the days in which all things was, must be fulfilled. I document how the apostles who sat in the synagogue every single Sabbath and heard the instruction of the rabbis. And let's make no mistake about this. Some of the contemporaries of Jesus in the first century, some of those Jewish rabbis actually appealed to Micah as proof that, the, that Jerusalem was supposed to be destroyed in their generation. Open your gates, O Lebanon. Is a re if a, one of the references uh, seem like that's Micah chapter two, I have to refresh my memory on that. Uh, but the point of it is, some of the some of the apostles, contemporary rabbis, had been teaching for years that the temple was supposed to be destroyed during the siege from, uh, of of during the war. If you, and you remember this from Josephus. When the gate swung open night after night after night, and this is a gate that normally took 20 men to open it and to close it. And yet night after night, this gate was opening. And one of the, one of the ma major rabbis of the time said, oh, gate, oh, gate, I know. We, we know that you will be destroyed, but why are you giving us this sign? <laughs> okay. So for us, you're going to be destroyed with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. But here you have all of this testimony in the Old Testament and, and in the contemporary sources as well, as well as Josephus. And we're supposed to believe that the that Jesus' apostles had no clue whatsoever that the that the temple was ever supposed to be destroyed. That's why they were so shocked and said, oh, tell us. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And when they asked about that, they weren't even talking about the destruction of that temple. They were talking about the end of the world. <laughs> the more you look at it, <clears throat> I think logically, the more ridiculous the traditional arguments truly become. Yeah. And I think we're out of time. Yeah, we are. And just to sum up, you know, we talk about these liberal critics like, Bart Ehrman and the gentleman you're going to be debating and um, the partial predators like Doug Wilson, Kenneth Gentry, Keith Matheson. The common error of both of these groups is that the Bible teaches the end of world history. Yep. And the partial predators just can't answer that argument against the liberals because the liberal says, hey, look, the end of the world was near. And you can't just say it was the old covenant world because... What about all these other passages? And it doesn't say there's two ends of the world. It just says there's one. And so the, it, it's just an inadequate um, apologetic against the liberal critic. And Don's going to have an opportunity to, to debate one of the world-renowned um, uh, critics of, of Scripture. So I can't yeah, wait for that. That's going to be good. I solicit everyone's prayers. This is yeah. going to be challenging. Uh, he is a brilliant, brilliant historian, primarily. He's not a theologian, but he is a historian. Uh, but he has that tr traditional skeptical view. Uh, mm -hmm. And I shared last week that uh, in our correspondence, he said, I take the view of most scholarship today that when Jesus was predicting uh, his coming and the end, the end of the age, he was referring to events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And just about fell out of my chair when I read that. I go, okay, that's going to go on a chart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that admission. <laughs> Amen. Half the debate has been won. <clears throat> so, <laughs> uh, but but the scholars know this, and, and then to see the um, the verbal machinations, the verbal gymnastics of the partial preterists to deny these very clear-cut statements and invent this, as you were saying, a doctrine of two different comings of the Lord and two two different ends of two different ages, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's troubling. I'm going to, con I'm going to conclude with one verse that I want folks to think about. We all know Matthew 16, 27, 28, but when you go to Mark's account, Mark 8, 38 and Mark 9, 1 right. is key. Because Jesus uses a tense here that's much different than the Ma Matthew's version. He's basically saying when, when the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father 
to reward each person with some of you standing here to witness it. You're going to be able to look back and know that my coming and the kingdom has, here it is, already come. Yep. Folks, does that sound like Jesus was teaching the end of world history? <laughs> no, it does not. Mm -hmm. I hope that gets in the chart because that's that to me is key. I don't need a church father. <laughs> I don't need Josephus. I've got Jesus's words telling me his second coming was going to take place then. There's not going to, and Ed Stevens is wrong. There's no secret rapture because these are folks <laughs> that are living beyond 80, 70. They're believers on earth. And they're able to look back and say, Jesus has come. We're in the new heavens and new earth. The kingdom yeah. of God is within us. No end of world history, folks. <clears throat> I'll never forget when I saw the Greek tenses on that mic, like so many other discoveries, the, so many Kodak moments, whatever, whatever you'd like to call it. <clears throat> I jumped up out of my chair and it was like, holy cow, this is, yeah, they're going to live up to it. They're going to live through it. They're going to look back on it. Yeah. It's right there. Sure wish Mr. Ed Stevens would get catch the power of that one. But uh, Amen. <laughs> well, All actually, right, we're out of time. Oh, uh, go ahead. I will explain this. Ed explains that now, or at least they did for a while by saying, well, yes, they look back on it because they're in heaven looking back on it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've noticed Ed's got all kinds of time to try and come to the conference. He's got all times to do. He's got all the time in the world to do some interviews on, on some of the issues of your written debate. But he just apparently still has not time to answer your questions in the debate. Well, um, hopefully yeah. that will be near. Yeah. He's but. supposedly working on it. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. All, right. All right. All right, brother. We'll see you next week. All right. All right. Take care. That I may walk before my God in the love. In the light of life, in the light of life, in the light of life.